Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. Our guest mentor today is Chidima Agaga, who's currently a member of the reporting organizations team at Royal Bank of Canada, which is Canada's largest bank and one of the biggest in the world based on their market cap. Chidima's track record in adding value across the financial service industry stretches back nearly two decades, and not just within finance and accounting, but also from her time leading customer services teams. Now, there was a load of key things that came up during the episode. Among the most memorable were the most important step we can all take when specialising in a particular area in finance and accounting. Chidham also shares a story of how she demystified the numbers to get a sense of their impact on the bottom line for business leaders, which ultimately helped increase revenues by an amazing 60% over the following two years. Then Chidham shares with us a best practice on how to provide support to any business partner or team we lead as well as a really cool idea about accountants becoming more like software developers and the value we can add there and also a very useful perspective that we can learn from the customer services department because Chidema used to lead customer services team as well as finance. As always you can find detailed timestamp show notes, the key quotes, links to the resources mentioned and ways to connect with our guest mentor today on our website and this episode is at sitnshow.com slash podcast slash zero two zero so look i really enjoyed having chidema on the show you'll get a sense of her passion for finance and accounting straight from the off it's a lot of energy in our conversation in actual fact one thing we didn't get around to talking on the show that i wish i had was prior colleague gave her the title of the executioner because chidema just gets so much stuff done and so much value added to the business. So there's loads of gems we unlock in this conversation, and I know you're going to enjoy this show. So without further ado, over to Chidema. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I must commend you that you said my last name very well. <laughs> Thanks. I've, I've been well-schooled in it. So, uh, no, thank <laughs> Well, look. Uh, That's good show. <laughs> well, look, we, we've had the chance to catch up previously, but uh, for those of our listeners who may be not as familiar with you, would you mind sort of spending a little bit of time uh, sharing a bit of your story so we get, they, we and they can get to know you a bit better? Okay, Andrew. Um, just like you said, I'm a, an accounting and finance professional with uh, almost two decade experience in financial services. I recently moved to Canada from Nigeria and back home, basically, my uh, career has been built around supporting businesses because I have a passion for partnering with business teams. And that's basically what I've done most of my career. And coming here in Canada, I joined the um, reporting statutory and regulatory reporting team in Royal Bank of Canada, and I'm still doing something along the same lines. My job roles require that I provide support to business units and platforms in the area of regulatory and statutory reporting, and something I find very exciting. Your passions are already coming across. So, uh, but I I was just wondering, that's a heck of a move from, which is essentially northern parts of Africa, all the way to North America. So, I suppose what's been the biggest surprise um, switching between the two continents? Definitely, there are certain things are different. First of all, of course, definitely you have different um, laws that apply here in Canada that are different from what we have back home. The work style is also a bit different. Back home, you're as an accountant, you're expected to be a master of like everything. But here I see that you're expected to specialize in a particular arm. Um, so for me, that was a big um that was I think the most big the biggest change I experienced professionally. The fact that here you have to specialize in one particular arm of finance, either analysis or tax or you like you don't just do everything. But back home as an accountant, you are kind of expected to be like the jack of all trade. And um, I see the reason why that is being done. I see that there's a, a deeper level of um, professionalism expected from you here that you're expected to turn up more, um, show more depth to your work than probably we were expected to do back home. And that requires quite a bit of time and you definitely have to just focus on one thing yeah, to give the best that you can. Uh, and Chidema, like for those in our audience faced with that, 
need to specialize and by the way i hear this advice an awful lot as our industry is becoming i guess more digitized and our businesses are expecting more from us particularly from a partnering perspective is be- is moving away from the master of all the jack of all trades to specializing in particular areas i suppose what sort of practical steps could others take to make that specialization journey or the journey towards specialization a bit less uh, painful a bit less challenging Okay, Andrew, I think that the first and most important step you need to take in um, specializing is knowing what your strengths are. What is it that you love doing? Are you one who is uh, who is more comfortable working with figures behind the scene, just crunching out the numbers? Or are you someone who likes to interface with people, help people partner with the business? Because that helps you choose what stream of accounting you really want to focus on. If you're someone who is who prefers to just work by yourself with the system and then crunch out the numbers, you probably want to go for a more of an analyst role where you're just sitting down and you're looking at reports and you're bringing in, um, you're, you're looking at number uh, data, you're analyzing data and you're churning out reports. But where you are someone who, like me, like I, I, I prefer to uh, meet with the people, I prefer to support the business directly. In that instance, you might want to go for a more people facing role. Yeah. So the first thing for me was like knowing what my strengths were and then knowing what area of accounting I wanted to specialize in. And that's the advice I'll give to anybody who is moving to an area. Ask yourself, what is it that I like to do? What is my work style? What do I what, what would I feel? What work style works best for, for my personality type? Once you figure that out, then the others are, is really, are relatively easier to deal with because accounting is a profession where you can apply your skills, your technical skills in different areas. So for me, the main important thing is knowing what you want to do, what gives you satisfaction and joy, and then you can apply your skills towards That's that That's really area. great advice, some great questions. I, you know, I just wish like someone had given me that advice <laughs> a bit earlier on, <laughs> because there's nothing more frustrating than people thinking that they need to try and overcome their weaknesses when really, if they looked at their strengths, they're going to enjoy their work an awful lot more and, exactly. and exactly. add more value exactly. to those around them. And, and like in terms of in terms of how you're doing that at the, at the moment, Chidema, I suppose, where, where do you find that the business is benefiting most from your strengths at the moment? I think that for me, one of the things I like demystifying the numbers, like I like to tell stories behind the numbers. I Earlier on in my career, I discovered that a lot of people just see accountants and um, finance professionals as people who just like throwing around bogus jargon words, you know, <laughs> I mean, typically as an accountant, <laughs> you're oh, trying to explain yeah. something, you tend to get very technical. Mm. And because I'm someone who likes to support businesses and during the course of my career, I've had to do many multi uh, functional projects. I've had to work on multifunctional projects where I work with people who do not necessarily have a finance and accounting background. So over the course of the years, I've had to learn how to communicate accounting terms, you know, in words that are very simple for the layman to understand. So there's something I tell myself that if I cannot explain a concept in a way that a grade two person will understand, then that means I myself haven't gotten a full understanding of it. So in the way I do my work, that's what I try to do. Currently now, you know, with whole IFRS 9 implementation right here in <laughs> North America, there is so much like IFRS now we all know is like the big bull. Like yeah. it's, it's just so much. But in the course of my career, I've seen that in supporting the businesses, I've had to like come up with templates, come up with terms, come up with like ways in which they can manage their portfolios, you know, and make it very simple, a simple, so, something simple that you don't need to be a CPA to be able to use it. I've had to break down the IFRS 9 requirements to very simple processes and steps that platforms and business leaders can use and apply in their portfolio without necessarily going crazy over it. And that's something I enjoy doing. I just enjoy simplifying the process, making everything simple. And it's, you know, it's not something you achieve in a day. As you go on, you keep making it better and better. Look, I I think that's great advice. And and I think a lot of people in our profession, even if they've specialised or whatever, if we really know our stuff, we should be able to communicate it to, it's like communicating it to kids. I think it was Albert Einstein or someone like that said that if you can't explain it to a two-year-old or to a kid, you don't really understand it yourself oh i need to i haven't even heard that but honestly that that's something i believe in also very strongly that if you can't explain technical terms in a very easy way tell a story around it that everybody can understand then there's a gap that you need to still fill. and actually i know i'm going to probably put you on the spot with the next question but like look can you maybe share one of your favorite stories of where you did that uh, what sort of story you had to tell or how you framed it so people could understand it better 
I'm going to give an example back home from the role I had before I moved to Canada, where I was um, I was basically heading the team that provided full circle accounting and back office support for electronic banking. Then in the, the, the country had come up with um, a, a new policy, a new monetary policy where they wanted they wanted to reduce, basically reduce the amount of cash in system. So they were encouraging everybody to go to electronic platforms and banks had a mandate, right, to sell electronic platforms to the customers. But because of previous experience, you know, there have been lots of cases of fraud or failed service. Customers were not really attuned to getting the product. But because it was now a regulatory policy, everybody had to, like, push for the adoption of that. Now, the challenge I had basically was that most of the, the business leaders I, were support, I was supporting were used to making their income from the traditional banking services, you know, giving out loans and stuff like mm -hmm. that. But they couldn't see like how getting a customer to have an ATM card or getting a retail customer to get a POS could really impact on their bottom line. They really couldn't, they really couldn't see the connection between that. So I had to come up, come up with a template a presentation template that just basically took just the one ATM card, first of all, break, showing them how one ATM card could, could translate to certain amount of money in terms of percentages at the point it's sold up to the point of continuous usage, how one POS machine could give them, you know, one Naira, uh, one Naira worth of um, transaction done on a POS machine could translate to their bottom line. I kind of like drew like a, a diagram, something like that, just to explain to them that, that process flow. Took a simple example of a customer that does a thousand naira transaction on a daily basis on his POS. Calculated that to show them how much money they're getting on a daily basis. Multiply that by 30 days of a month. Multiply that by say 30 customers you're able to sign on. And just by putting that presentation together and then sending it out to the business unit, you could see that there was interest in the business leaders. They really wanted to know more. <laughs> of course, it was just, I didn't go into all the details of all the other costs and everything involved, but I just took it to just the barest minimum, the barest minimum they could get. And I saw that by putting that presentation together and sending it out to them, it kind of piqued their interest on learning more about electronic banking space. And then they started making more inquiries and we started building on that simple understanding. And at the end of the day, we were able to increase the revenue from electronic banking by 60% wow. just by simplifying the revenue model of how electronic banking products Imagine work. Imagine that if we could just explain other things much more simply and help people get the message, then the, yeah. how much more value finance could be driving for the business? 60% 60, 60 is phenomenal. Oh, yes. 60% over two years. Honestly, it was really a big turnaround for us. Oh, fantastic story. So look, really appreciate you sharing that. And I know I put you on the spot a bit there. Um, <laughs> no. oh, oh, and look, you know, the questions of this are never easy. But then again, the experiences at the time, they're, they're quite challenging and tough for us to, to get over. And that's why we share these these stories. I, I suppose looking ahead a bit then to the, the future, are there sort of any other good practices that we should be doing in accounting and finance to perhaps even add more value uh, than we currently are? Well, personally, for me, in my experience, I found out that at the start of my career, I was very technically minded. Like I, would, I was just concerned with the figures, the work that had to be done. Right. But as I, I developed in my career, I saw that there was a need to understand your business partnerships, mm -hmm. understand the role like understand the aspirations and the roles of the, of the of the partners that you're supporting because basically accounting is a support function, right? You have to understand the view from your customer's uh, perspective. So you must have the ability to communicate. And in communicating, it's not just um, expressing your own views, but understanding fully what the other person is trying to, uh, understanding the view from the other person's point of view, more or less. Mm -hmm. That's the best way that you can provide support for any business team. You have to see like the full, the whole 360 degrees point of view. And don't think that there's just one right way to solve a problem. In, in, accounting is full of principles yeah. and standards. So we all, always tend to feel like there's just one way to do this. But over the course of my career, I've found out that if there's not just one way, there are always different ways to arrive at the same solution. So I think that as accountants, we have to be flexible and open-minded enough to look at things from different perspectives. Yeah, and I used two very important words there, flexible and open-minded. Minded. And the more shows we do, 
these keep coming up again and again. Is there any sort of simple steps, you know, we could start taking to be more flexible and open-minded? Honestly, I think the best way you could do that is just to listen. And then as in when, you, when I say listen, like really listen to people, really listen to the business, really listen to the teams that you're supporting and try and see things from their point of view. Not with a mindset of, oh, I already know how this should be solved, but from could this, could there be another way? See, Andrew, the world is going digital and we are having computers and softwares replacing the work that accountants do right now. And the only way I feel that we can stay relevant is if we are flexible enough to provide more support for our business teams. And you can only do that by understanding fully what is required for you by, uh, from you by your partner. I couldn't agree more. Uh, I suppose there's one, I mean, I use a template myself because I, I don't know if I find a, a teams I've led, we just respond better to checklists. And it was like, look, fill this in, right? This is your, your list of partners. This is, yeah. you know, this is some blank space in there around, this is what they should have or, or they think they should have or what they think that they want. And then, yeah. you know, the gap between the two is the problem we go solve for them. And uh, I think another really useful phrase that's come up on these shows so far is that, you know, there's a reason why we have two ears and one mouth. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, so you listen to it as much as you speak, yeah, exactly, right? <laughs> exactly. You got it. And I think all, you know, all the good mentors out there appreciate that. So I think, look, that's that's some really great advice. And the impending yeah, actually, it's not impending. It's it's already here. Digital. It's just going to become more prevalent than it already is. Exactly. It's going exactly. to force us to have to be more flexible and more open minded. And I guess with that yeah. whole digital progression, you're in financial services, uh, working in accounting and finance. There, where do you yeah. see it impacting the most at the moment in your mind? I think that um, more than anything, the, our definition of our roles as a, as accountants is changing. It has changed already. Yeah. Anyway, with the advent of, um, of technology and all the changes that we're seeing, and um, we can no longer just focus on the traditional expectation of of account from accountants. We have to become like um, begin to think like uh, business developers, business leaders, for us to remain relevant in this time. You have to reinvent yourself. More or less, it's not just about now, it's not just about your technical skills. It's more, the, the focus now is more on how you are able to use your technical skills to support non-traditional roles. Um, I see accountants becoming more involved in developing like software solutions and stuff because, you know, as accountants, we get to see more of the business than any other team because you, you get to see every other different aspect. And I think it's time for us to bring all the knowledge we have, which probably we haven't been using before, all those silent knowledge we get from carrying out our duties and then applying it directly to helping a business grow and develop to its full potential. Yeah, I actually never thought about it like that. Finance or software developers. You know, I've seen that. I've, I've actually seen it. I've experienced it. I mean, that's that's an interesting turn of phrase to use. Why, why, why software developers? Um, well, I use that term because in the course of my work, I've had I've had the opportunity of working on projects where there was either an upgrade of a core banking application or the development of a new application, autom automating processes, basically. And I, I find that as an accountant, I'm able to have a better appreciation of the value of automation to the business. Well, maybe, maybe I'm being too... <laughs> no, but really, I just feel that my point of view as an accountant, I'm not just looking at the figures, but I can see how that automation is going to impact on the bottom line for the business. I can see how it's going to improve on profitability. I can see how that in turn is going to reduce staff costs. I, I can see a bigger picture of the entire project. And because of that experience and that um, insight that I have, I'm able to advise the teams that are developing on, on ways they can actually plan it better. And because of my exposure to such projects, Honestly, I personally said, I think, you know what, I can actually partner with a software company and say, okay, we can develop project, um, uh, 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 you know, like different type of solutions for people. And this is just from being open minded. Like I said, you speak with um, an IT person, an IT person might know how to put the codes and everything together. But because you have a business perspective, you can see the numbers, you can see how that automation is going to impact on the numbers. You can put together a full solution for a customer. I, I, I agree. And actually, that's, 
you know, in some of the larger companies I've definitely partnered with, you know, we actually have internal teams like data scientists that, that can help. And it's amazing what we can even pick up off of them. And now you're seeing accountants and finance professionals uh, scripting with SQL and working yep. with relational databases, spending more time um, working with those and understanding those because they appreciate, you know, they appreciate how important it is to collect the data, connect the dots, but also then convey exactly. the message. We can do all three. Yes, Andrew, they, we can tell the story behind the numbers and that's what makes us a valuable asset in that Completely. space. There was one fascinating aspect that I really wanted to talk to you more on. Now, I've I've worked and I really enjoyed, I suppose, most of my fun in my career has been working with uh, with services, but but from the finance perspective. But you actually led, led service teams in yes, the past. So, uh, one, what possessed you to do that and, and what was the key learning for you for, for working in the business managing customer service? For me, like I said, one of my passion is just partnering with business and helping businesses to develop. And um, the way I got to start managing business was when I started my career in financial services. Um, I remember that we had a branch manager who basically said, look, for every minute you spend, he said something to me that really impacted my psyche and the way I think. And he just said that as the staff, you know, of, of whatever organization you are in, Every day and every hour you spend at work, you should be able to calculate how much you are contributing to, how much return you are contributing. So at the end of the day, I mean, you know what you're earning in a day. You should ask yourself if you've been able to get that money for your employer. So I remember then I was just a, uh, working in funds transfer. But at the end of the day, I would sit down and like go through what I have done and said, OK, how much income have I generated by the work that I have done today. And I asked myself if I've been able to pay my own salary. That was my mindset when I started working, you know? And at the point I became the leader of the team, I was able to bring my understanding of how we support staff, service staff can actually impact on the bottom line. I get my staff thinking about like, on a daily basis, whatever you're doing, you're processing cash, you're processing a customer's transaction. How much are you contributing to the profit of the branch or of the organization as a whole. And you know the funny thing, because I started getting my staff to also think that way, you would see that sometimes when a customer comes to the transaction, they are actually able to give better advice. They're not just walking, like doing what they're supposed to do, but they are trying to add value because they see that they need to earn enough to pay their own salary. They're thinking from a business perspective, you know, and that actually um, like inspire them to provide better service. You know, from a work with uh, with services, you can actually see where some of the support teams can even help drive not only profits for the business, but value for the customer. You know, yeah. we even set up certain roles that, that did that because they had an intimate knowledge of the challenges customers were facing on the front lines. And then as long as there was a conduit or a mechanism for them to feed that back through the business and yeah. realize, well, look, the customer's struggling with this. If we did this for them, you know, that might make them want to stay with us a bit longer or actually upgrade their services with us or, you know, even improve the customer satisfaction or promoter scores. There's yeah. so much um, so much value that can be offered in customer service. Uh, yeah. And what a great place to work. I suppose, you know, in terms of comparing customer service with finance, is there sort of anything we could learn from customer service that we can also bring back into our, our finance teams? What you have to always understand is that a business or an, uh, yeah, an organization is in business because of the customer. So even as a finance team, you have to also ask yourself, who is my customer? Who am I in business for? Right. And your whatever you're doing, your processes, your um, operation flow should be in favor of the customer, not in your favor. Which brings me back to what I'm saying. Like sometimes as finance professionals, we get so caught up with our, proce our procedures, our uh, concepts, you know, that we forget that the reason we do all of this in the first place is to support the customer. So you must ask yourself as a finance uh, professional, who is your customer? If it's the business, then whatever you do is to support them, is to make things easier for them and not make it more difficult. So from that perspective, I think we as uh, as professionals to be able to better support yeah, at, um, at our businesses. Actually, you just reminded me of a funny story. It was, uh, <laughs> I'm not going to say the company I was uh, working with, but it was on one of my interim engagements. And I had one of the teams <laughs> complaining about how annoying the customers were. And I said, oh, those annoying customers, you mean the ones that actually pay your wages? 
<laughs> it's yeah, like exactly. there would be no business without the customers and you know like they were in finance and it's very easy being sometimes removed from so far from the front line to think like that but you know like uh, there was a yeah. really good discussion on LinkedIn and they were asking whether or not finance was a cost center or profit center but really you know there is no such thing internally really as a profit center or cost center the only true profit exactly. center is the customer Exactly. The, that, the customer is the only true profit center. It's the only true profit center. So whatever we do must be something that is geared towards making our processes and our products easier for the customer to access. Oh, I completely agree. And very well well articulated, Chidema. So, um, so I wish I was able to say that as well as you have just been able to say it now all those years <laughs> ago. So, so look, uh, we're going to step it up a bit. We've got a few lightning round questions. Okay. I was just curious, what was, what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received? I would say it's to develop my um, emotional intelligence. Yeah. You know, I, I, I was worked with a manager who told me like, look, the only way you can ad- advance professionally and do that fast is if you learn how to work with people. And I found that to be very true. You know, you could be ambitious, you can think, you can push, but nobody by themselves can. You, I, I, I strongly believe that you cannot achieve your full potential in isolation you need to be able to work with people you need to be able to collaborate and learn to understand people and the only way you can build that is by developing your emotional intelligence you have to be able to read people know how to work with them know how to bring out the best in them and sometimes as you do that you become a better person yourself and then you're also able to you know, become the best that you can you know, be. And on your, your journey developing that sort of your skills, emotional intelligence, I suppose, what if other people were to follow that type of journey, like what what's something they could practically work on to, to get going? I would go back to something I said earlier, um, Andrew, which is just to listen to people. Like yeah. really listen. Yeah, that, that's a skill that I see that we can never master, right? Sometimes you feel that, oh, I'm a good listener, but you have to keep asking yourself, am I really listening? Am I practicing good communication skill you have to build yourself up in that again yeah. looking for, for some more advice off of you if, if you were to recommend say an audio book or a book to our listeners that would help them in their careers what would be your recommendation okay one book that i read a couple of months ago and that book honestly i, I wonder why i hadn't read it earlier was Lean In, yeah, Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg. That book really spoke to me. Now, it, it might seem like it's a book meant for females, but I don't think so. It's actually a book meant for everybody. But that book, honestly, it just changed my perspective on a lot of things. And yeah. just, uh, just to get for our listeners, like what, what was maybe the one thing that stood out to you in terms of changing your perspective that, that you could share with us? Okay, the one thing that stood out for me from the book was, you know, when Sheryl was talking about how sometimes the decisions we make and the choices we make, it's not just things we believe in, but just like the the sum of the, the noise in our head, mm-hmm. kind of. And the noise in your head is com- coming from cultural expectations and oh. things from people. Yeah. So I really had to sit down and like reevaluate my life. And I saw that really some of the things I do, it's not like I couldn't do something else. I could have taken a different decision, but because... I'm not being mindful of the influence of culture or people's expectations on me. I've kind of like made some choices I probably would not have made. So since reading that book, it's helped me to be more deliberate when I make decisions. I'm more deliberate. I'm thinking, what is what, what is the basis of this decision? What is making me make this de- decision? And so I'm more deliberate and more true to myself. I, I always wonder about those those bits of advice, Jinima, because I feel exactly the same as you. I mean, there's some books recently that I've read and it's like, well, where have you been? all that time particularly the ones about <laughs> slowing down sometimes and just to take it in and, and make uh, more deliberate decisions and like yeah. I, i'd regard myself and others would as, as uh, regard me as quite decisive but you know maybe it's just we're more ready to to learn those things as we've sort of progressed a bit and had those hard-won lessons that we can reflect back on because yeah i, I imagine yeah. there's no way we miss these these ideas earlier on we just probably didn't have enough people or resources reinforcing it as perhaps yeah. is because we're doing that with others now. We're talking on this podcast, but we're yeah. also reading this and we're also spotting these things and we're sharing them with others. So we're probably just more mindful of it now. Whereas we- more mindful. Yeah, I think I think that's very correct, Andrew, because sometimes you actually need those experiences to reflect on and then grow from but, them. But at yeah. least we can share those experiences with others because <laughs> I, I just try to think yes. back. I don't think many people shared those with me. You know, that word mindful, I can't remember it appearing the first 10 years of my career. <laughs> so I'm sure that's the same for a lot of others out there. So yes, to oh, our audience, mindful. 
for me. <laughs> <laughs> be mindful to be mindful, you know. Yeah. Um, so no, that's great. Um, I look at just the, just a couple more questions now, Chidima. I suppose look, if there was one thing that you know, if you could change about finance, accounting, and finance over the next twelve months, what thing would you change? Oh, definitely, it would be the technical focus. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously, Andrew, like. You know, I sh- I tell this to my colleagues sometimes in the office that as finance people, we ju- sometimes we're just too caught up in the technical aspect. You know, and probably just like you said, maybe because I've had a uh, privilege in my experience to work with the service um, to um, lead service, right? And then I'm now going into core um, accounting. But I, I I think that as accountants, sometimes we need to just look beyond the numbers, look beyond the data yes. crunching. We need to get to really know the and feel the heart of the business because we will be able to do so, so much more to support our team when we're able to do that. So if there's one thing I would like to change is that technical focus, because even in school, everybody's just teaching you about the technical oh, things, the technical yeah. things. There's no emphasis, you know, on the other skills that you need to actually make um, for me, a full impact as an accountant. So definitely that's one thing I would like to change. And, you know, have accountants who have a more broader view and are able to support the teams better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. look, I, on that one, that's a really tough one because, look, I'm not going to get into it here. But anyway, yeah. I feel like, yeah, it's, that's just a whole other show. Uh, but look, my comments on this are well well made on LinkedIn if people want to track them down. But yeah, it's it's it, there's an element of personal responsibility, I think, on the behalf of individual accountants and finance professionals, but also on educational bodies out there who are making profits of keep keeping, you know, selling these technical courses, which if you look at your in- email inboxes, they, they yeah. tend to be technical rather than those softer skills. And exactly. they're not making them free either, even though a lot of people pay their subscriptions every year. You know, which again, like this podcast, is is there any reason given the expertise, experience and the mentors that already exist in our profession why these things just can't be free? So, yeah. So so my point made, I'm going to have to probably edit that one out because it's um, that's like me on a soapbox. (laughs) We'll see. We'll see how I feel when we edit it. (laughs) But uh, that's the great thing about not being live. I can say whatever I want and change my mind later on. (laughs) So, so Chinnaba, look, fantastic conversation. Really enjoyed getting to know you and fantastic practical advice that people yeah. can take step by step to improve the impact they make in their careers for their organizations. If, you know, our people want to know more about you and, and contact you, where's the best place they can connect with you? Um, I think LinkedIn is the best platform that anybody can reach me on right now. Um, yeah. On LinkedIn, I'm always on LinkedIn, so like just check for my name and send me an invite with a note, and um, I'm always glad and happy to connect. Yes. Oh, fantastic, Chidima! And look, um, I really appreciated you taking the time to talk with us today. I put all the sort of resources that we've come up on the the show um, in our detailed show notes. And I'll timestamp to the various topics we covered as well. But I just wanted to say a big thank you again for investing the time with us today and really appreciate you, your thoughts and your mentorship for our audience on the show. Thanks very much, Jidima. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to Andrew. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter, which will give you a heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news, and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding, and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working, or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. When all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care.
and let's keep building our strength in the numbers.